everyone. Welcome to Coffee Time with Emma. My guest today is Becky Parent, Executive Director of Big Brothers Big Sisters right here in Windsor. Big Brothers is an amazing organization uh, with a mission to help all young people reach their potential through mentoring. Becky, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, you're so welcome, my friend Gemma. Thank you so much for having me on today. Oh, I'm happy you're here. So I got my coffee. I drink it black. How do you drink your coffee? I mine is regular. What's regular? I really need to learn to drink mine black. I think that would be much better for me. Okay. Yeah, no. I mean, it's just easier. That's one of the reasons. And you can really get the full flavor of the coffee as well. So. It's true. It's absolutely true. I'm a wimp. I still need my cream and sugar. <laughs> That's great. It does help the flavor. I like to have a little cream and sugar sometimes on the weekends, but not today. Um, but yeah, no, good girl. I want us to chat a little bit about Big Brothers, Big Sisters, your organization, and yeah. the importance of mentoring in young people's lives. Um, and I've mm -hmm. seen stories of people whose lives have been transformed as a result of that relationship. Tell me which for you was, was the most meaningful story that you've heard about someone whose life has been impacted. Oh, we have so many, um, you know, the, it, we have so many. So publicly, I mean, if, if we look at public figures in Windsor, Essex, um, there are many people in, um, you know, senior management positions uh, in the community. Some have been very public about their history uh, with Big Brothers, Big Sisters as former little brothers and former little sisters, um, investment advisors, uh, directors, senior directors at the University of Windsor, oh. um, you know, program managers. Um, right now, the our, the chair of our board, uh, Andy Sullivan, uh, was a former big a former little brother of ours many years ago, and he's certainly are now successful. Uh, he's the director of programs and services with the local YMCA. So every day, Gemma, we're seeing stories that that change lives. I mean, just recently we had a match close because the the little brother is now 18, and the uh, the big brother has actually just had his first child. Um, uh, his his wife's just had his, their first child. And, um, you know, when the little brother came to us, you know, he, you know, the, you know, you get the teacher reports, you get the parent reports, and you get all of the challenges uh, associated with with those early reports. And um, he really needed a strong male influence in his life, a strong mentor in his life, um, to kind of help him navigate his feelings and, um, you know, some feelings of anger, um, some academic struggles that he was having in early, early elementary school and, and and uh, later in elementary school. But, you know, we matched him with uh, an amazing uh, young man uh, who um, taught him to skate, taught him to play hockey, um, supported him in so many ways. Um, and, you know, just they had common interests, like, you know, actually one of their common interests was going to horror houses. Um, you know, those houses of horrors. Oh, horrors horror <laughs> Sorry, that was like, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, horror houses, houses of horror, museums and things that, um, so they did that together and played hockey every week. And this young man, I wish you could see him today. Um, his teacher reports are stellar. Um, he's off to pursue uh, a trade. Um, he just, you know, thinks the world of his big brother and wants to be like him um, and says this, you know, says, I just want to be like my big brother. He was so supportive to me and uh, I want to follow in his footsteps for sure. That's amazing. What an amazing relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't help but wonder when you pair up like big brothers with little brothers, um, um, that relationship must really stand the test of time. And even after they're not in the program, so to speak, when they turn 18, uh, do you have any stories about people that have continued that friendship bond after they've aged out that you're aware of? Uh, absolutely. So we have a, a big, big and little, well, not, we have many, so many, um, these, these relationships can last a lifetime um, when they're matched for, for a long time. And that match closes because of, you know, they just age out of the program. They always say to us, you know, 
we're actually friends now um, and we're just going to stay, you know, friends and we don't really need the support of, of the agency anymore. And that that's a good day for us. We're sad because we're not going to see them as often anymore, but um, we're happy too, because we know that they'll continue their friendship and same with big sisters and little sisters as well. Um, you know, they go on to stand in one another's weddings and um, they become part of each other's families. We have big brothers who um, are kind of, you know, pseudo grandfathers to their former little brother's children. Um, we have little brothers who have gone into exactly the same type of work. So we've got tons of little brothers who have become police officers because their big brother was a police officer, for instance. Um, engineers, um, people that, you know, uh, they really do want to follow in their, their big sisters or their big brother's uh, footsteps. And, and they've been given information and they've been given a bridge and a path to follow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, often they meet they meet their big brother or big sister when they're just starting their career or they're just graduating from university even uh, or post-secondary and and or starting their career and and they'll watch and they they know the steps to take and that big brother big sister really help them along the way get their first job help them with their resume um, improve their math grades if if they need to improve their math grades to get into a certain program this is the kind of support that we see so you know you see a lot of pictures of hockey playing and road hockey and crafts and baking and um, you know all kinds of uh, recreational pursuits that big big brothers and big sisters pursue with their littles um, but in the end it's much more than that um, and and it's incidentally acquired right conversations just happen very naturally after they get to know one another and it's kind of like you know we can't uh, meet as often in the next couple weeks because I've got exams right now. Um, you know, uh, big brother or big sister might say when they're in university or college and little brother hears that, right? And wants to know about that. And mm -hmm. so these conversations just naturally occur and those bridges to that little brother's or little sister's uh, future uh, are, are, are really well laid out. Um, and that's how they, um, and that's how they succeed. It's great for sure. I mean, what a what an amazing way to like set up youth and kids for success by pairing them with. Well, you know, we're part. Please, continue. who care and and that's right, and who can give them the knowledge to help navigate that? Because often the one thing in common that some of our littles have is that they don't have the tools to navigate uh, where they want to go. Um, so it may be that their parent, they're from single parent families. Um, certainly all our little brothers are. Um, none of our little brothers in the program have dads. Um, and so many of our little sisters as well are single parent families. Most are. Um, and, you know, they, they may not have, they have awesome parents who love them, um, but are busy and have, you know, and, and maybe don't have the same experiences um, that another adult has just to help them, um, you know, move through some unknown territory, right? Mm -hmm. So mom or dad may say to us, or grandma and grandpa may say to us, or foster parent may say to us, you know, we want the best for our child. Um, we just don't know how to get them there. Uh, we don't have the experiences that they need to rely on um, to, to navigate that kind of experience and so they I give parents uh, and grandparents and foster parents such great credit um, because they are truly our partners in this program they want the best for their kids and um, they really know that it's another adult who needs to come on uh, and come become involved in their child's life and uh, for just a, oh, an hour or a few hours a week um, and uh, and make that difference Wow. And so I know things must be very different um, over the like the last two years. Tell us how like COVID um, and the pandemic mm -hmm. affected your operation. So so, yeah, we we pre pandemic. So first of all, we're part of um, we're part of uh, about 100 organizations across Canada and thousands of big brother, big sister organizations in the U.S., who all um, believe that the way to change communities is changing the ch uh, ch children's lives by mm -hmm. providing them with mentorship one, one life at a time. Um, and before the pandemic, we all saw 
you know, great success. Um, in Windsor, Essex, we were serving eight, nine hundred uh, children and youth uh, a year, um, both in schools, uh, in our school programs, and uh, and in our community programs, which is what people normally traditionally think about when they think about big brothers or big sisters. Um, but the pandemic, of course, had a had a very large effect on on everybody, and that's just not just big brothers, big sisters. That's every youth serving agency, every business, every not for profit organization, obviously, um, in the world. And so, like others, we we definitely uh, took a hit. Um, you know, when we sent everyone home two years ago with laptops. Um, and said, you know, work from home for the next few weeks, and then we'll be back in the office. None of us realized at all that this was going to happen. Um, we were luckier than, than most, and I would say lucky, but also extremely blessed to have dedicated staff and dedicated volunteers. Um, some organizations and, and that I've heard about, and, and no fault of their own, said, you know what, we're going to have to lay everyone off. Um, we don't have the tools to to do this. We don't have the um, the ability to pivot, the ability to think about how we're going to keep these matches going or how we're going to keep our programs running. Um, but our staff just leaned in and they said, you know what, we want to have these conversations with our mentors. We want to find out what they can do uh, and what they can't do, what they're comfortable mm -hmm. doing. Um, and so we we went to a fully virtual model. Uh, at first, and we stayed there for a long time and really empowered our matches. Um, so if littles needed uh, equipment, most often they were getting that equipment from their school boards. Um, but you know what, if, if they needed equipment still, we were luckily able to um, go to donors and go to funders and ask for that uh, help. Um, if they needed help navigating uh, the, their laptops and their so the, the meeting software, staff leaned in to help, volunteers leaned in to help. They did everything from, you know, sitting on porches uh, with laptops to, um, you know, phoning on the phone while they were on. Um, some, you know, littles since then have lost their ability to, to uh, communicate via laptop or, or software, whatever ha has happened, they've uh, their laptop's not working or whatever, they've lost internet connection. Um, and our volunteers have just risen to every challenge we can imagine, and our staff as well. Um, you know, there's a there's a great story. There was a an agency in, um, it's up near Barrie, and they had so many uh, littles because they're in a rural area that didn't have connection to Wi-Fi. So their way of pivoting, well, they're rural, right? So their, right. their Wi-Fi was sketchy. And so their way of pivoting was to say, yes, you can meet in person. Um, you need to wear a mask. Even in during lockdowns, they allowed them to meet in person. But the rule was, and this is so Canadian, this is awesome. Um, the rule was they had to hold a hockey stick between them. <laughs> yeah, that's about six feet long. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfection. I so love that was their role. That's mm. great. That's great. And I we had similar situations during the, the, the rural heavy lockdowns where volunteers said, you know what, I have to, we have to see one another. He's, he's in a crisis. She's in a crisis. She really, um, with school being out, with online learning, there, there's some things that we need to do in person. And you know what, if we had to make it happen, we had to make it happen. As I said, porches, backyards. Yeah. Um, you know, parents were awesome as well, letting us uh, be as involved as we needed to. That's great. That's great. I mean, um, what an amazing way of just showing. I mean, I can't imagine ceasing the program just because we're, you know, in a pandemic. So definitely pivoting and being able to find, you know, work with your bigs, your big brothers, big sisters, mm -hmm. find out what they're willing makes absolute great sense. And, and there's always a way, right? Like grocery store trips. Where can we go? <laughs> right? <laughs> things like that. Part well, and also too, yeah, for sure. And, and also too, you know, um, the, uh, the school boards were amazing working mm -hmm. with us. So we have a mentoring program, of course, that you know of that the uh, mentors go in once a week for one hour and that was off limits. So they gave us full access, um, 
with you know the the right uh, safety measures around it um, and parent consent of course to have those programs go virtual as well um, and I have to give our school boards amazing credit um, on both the Greater Essex and the Catholic District because they were so good to us um, in allowing us to pivot and to continue serving kids mm -hmm. um, in schools because they, they certainly didn't have to they were stressed enough uh, with everything they had going on, um, but they they saw us as a support. Um, they knew that their kids needed the support. They needed the um, consistency, and uh, they they leaned in as well. Mm -hmm. And I know when we first started chatting, you you mentioned like these um, profiles um, that you get on on the on the littles as you as you set them up and the, how the teachers are involved in that uh, and the parents are involved in that. Um, what kind of information are you getting from the, the school specifically about the littles? Well, kids are stressed. I mean, they're stressed to the max, you know, um, certainly the time at home. Uh, was terrible for for our kids. Um, you know, uh, again, it, you know, it, it's sort of the, the higher up on the on the socioeconomic chain you are, mm -hmm. um, you know, the better off you fared in the pandemic, right? So kids who had parents who could work at home um, and had all the equipment and had good use of and knowledge of computer software did did fine. You know, although I know it was stressful for everyone. Um, but but the the kids in our program or, or a great many of them anyway um, didn't have that kind of support. Their their mom or dad or grandparent um, had to keep working, um, and they were needing to find childcare. Or many of them were our frontline workers, grocery store you know clerks and retail and that kind of thing. Or um, or they didn't have great Wi-Fi, or they didn't have access to or knowledge of uh, software systems, right? So they were already struggling. I, I know one, one little, well, not one, many actually, but this is one story that, that really hit home, was we don't normally provide a ton of direct homework help unless mm -hmm. it's absolutely needed, but like tutoring. We will find tutoring if they need tutoring, but we don't usually ask our bigs to, to do a lot of tutoring. Um, that's certainly changed in the pandemic because falling behind in schoolwork was such a source of stress for our kids that, and they knew they were behind and they mm -hmm. felt that they were behind. You can't fool kids, kids know, mm -hmm. you know? And so they needed their mentor to actually lean in and help them um, because it was becoming a source of mental health um, stress and you know challenge for them um, so in that way it, it was great for our, our volunteers to do that they just leaned in again and um, helped them through that 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 stuff mm -hmm. I mean definitely um, you're right when you think about the last two years I can absolutely see how anxiety would be rising, not only in, you know, in all of us, in all of us as we deal with the pandemic, right? It's a completely different way of going about our daily lives that we're not accustomed to. Um, and um, there's anxiety uh, that goes along with that. So I think it's really great that, you know, your your mentors were able to kind of step in and, and help them with like that critical need that they needed at that time, which was homework help. But I mean, do you find that that, um, that your bigs are helping interact them with, with them more on on teaching them how to deal with their with their mental health, with their anxiety, with their emotions specifically. Can you chat a little bit about that, please? Sure, and and that's a big part of our program, of course, is that that mental health support, right? Um, that that friendship that is really a listening ear, someone who really listens, someone who remembers. Uh, from one week to the next, what those challenges, largest challenges are, you know, even just a matter of how did that math test go last week? You know, how did, how did you make out with that struggle you were having with a, a peer in class with that friend of yours who was bullying that other student and you were there or, or whatever. Um, and that's always been part of our program. Certainly those needs have have been heightened um, and our volunteers have needed the help with our, of our trained social work staff. Um, so every match is a sign.
assigned to a caseworker um, in nine tenths of the staff of ours, um, our staff are social workers. So, um, or if they're not social workers, they're child and youth care uh, diplomas from St. Clair College. They have wide experience working with children and youth. Um, so anytime a volunteer is struggling with that kind of issue, um, whether it's to find a, a other resources for their little or to, to even just toss a conversation by their, their social worker um, to to see if they handled it well or, or is this the way they should handle it in the future, um, our casework staff are right there. So they manage every, every match. Um, they have great relationships uh, with their bigs and with their in-school mentors, and they're able to help them navigate that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, we've been working harder than ever, right? Uh, trying to manage those kinds of stressors and families too, who reach out to, to the caseworker and say, I, you know, we need some support in this area. Uh, can you help us out with this? Or how do I handle this conversation? Um, this is really stressful for him, or this is really stressful for her. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're seeing some behaviors that we've never seen. Um, we're getting some reports from teachers, um, and we really need some help. Wow, wow, definitely. And I think that there's gonna be a lot more need for that, especially as we move you know, from pandemic into endemic and what that looks like on a daily basis. Um, if you could, you know, design a system where, you know, your littles had everything that they needed, not only in your programs, but um, in schools as well, what would you, what would you implement? Well, I mean, that's a big question, right? That's a big question and a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, poverty in our community is uh, is hitting the kids in our community the, the hardest. Um, I know there's been a lot of supports for uh, folks who are homeless downtown and uh, in other areas of the city. There's And, and good, I'm glad for that. And, and housing is a huge issue. Um, housing insecurity, you know, hits our, our families hard. Um, and that hits children hard when they have to change schools and they have to change neighborhoods and they lose friends. And, you know, maybe they just got through, um, you know, broke through a way to deal with their local bully and now they've got to start all over again at a new school right or um, you know the stress that comes with even the unknown of that um, poverty is a huge issue um, not just in our community but in Canada um, Windsor West you know and I, I it's this is the opposite end of the city but Windsor West has the highest one of the highest child poverty rates in Ontario if not the highest actually Windsor West, the riding, has the in the neighborhood has the highest rate of child poverty in Ontario, and I think it's the third or fourth highest child poverty rate in Canada. That is shocking. That Windsor, Ontario, has that statistic. I, I mean, it, it's shameful. Um, downtown Windsor also has skyrocketing po poverty, um, family and child poverty. Um, and those two areas we know specifically um, are, are really hard hit. I mean, if you're already living in a low income situation and something like a pandemic hits where you've got additional costs and transportation and, and, and now with rising food costs and rising transportation costs, families are, are our families are hard hit. Yeah. Yours and mine. Just imagine the families that are living already on the margins because their income is, is, you know, tenuous and their income and their housing is, is tenuous and their means of living is day to day, you know, and, and they can't plan for the future because no, there's no thinking about the future when your income is, is just, just meeting your monthlies or not. When you're deciding every month, whether to, to eat or to pay the rent, that's a bad day yeah. um, and that's a bad decision. So certainly there are families that we serve that are in that situation, um, not all, but there definitely are lots of families in our, our agency who are in that situation. So I would say income, uh, child poverty is, is um, the, you know, it's, it's, and it's also the largest, has the largest effects on, on community. Um, you know, if we look at, at some of the issues like homelessness. These are not unrelated to child poverty. Um, you know, child poverty that was never dealt with. 
you know, kids who never got a mentor. Um, what I think about when I see someone who is living on the street, sleeping rough, I think they didn't have a big brother. They needed a big sister or they needed some intervention in their life that would help them with the future, uh, future decisions they made around addictions or uh, mental health. They didn't get the supports that they needed when they were kids and when they were young adults. Um, and so for sure, so that relates to everything, right? Poverty, housing, um, definitely, um, you know, social supports, mental health supports, um, greater mental health supports than we see because again, we can only do so much. You know, these are, our volunteers are, are trained. We train them in, you know, in great ways, child safety and, um, we give them tons of ongoing training whenever we, we need to around, you know, working with kids in care, for instance, from the Children's Aid Society. Um, you know, what violence looks like, signs of child abuse, child endangerment, um, neglect. They know all those signs, but they're not social workers. They're not mental health workers. They're just people like you and I, Jem, who... Um, you know, who work in different fields, all kinds of fields, right? And, um, and so we do need more mental health supports in our community, even for parents and for, for young adults, right? Uh, and for kids too. So I would say those are the three, income supports, housing, and mental health supports. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for like, painting that picture, right? Because um, so many times we, we, we kind of approach these challenges in silos and don't really realize how they kind of stretch over mm -hmm. how, you know, um, precarious income can affect a family's life and, and housing and mental mm -hmm. health. Uh, and then what effect does that have on your children and what their school life looks like and how they're, how they're doing in school and what their future looks like if it never turns around. So thank you for really clearly, you know, illustrating um, for, for myself as well as for our viewers, you know, how it's intertwined uh, and completely mm -hmm. connected. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I have to ask the question, how many, how many big, how many littles do you have that are still looking for a big brother or a big sister? Um, we have about uh, a little less than, than 100 on our wait list. Um, boys wait way longer than girls. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some hard truths that are not fun to admit. Um, but some of the boys on our program, in our program, wait as long as two or three years for a big brother. I know it's shocking. It's awful, actually. Um, but we don't have men come forward um, the way women tend to volunteer. So we always, you know, if we advertise nothing but for male volunteers, uh, we would still get a ton of female volunteers. Um, but but so we really are needing uh, male volunteers always because our boys do wait so much longer. Um, yeah, that's what we need, volunteers for sure. I mean, with such an extensive list of partners in the community, I can't help but wondering if there's like a way through partnership uh, when I think about some some hats you used to wear in the past, if there's a way that we could design a leadership program <laughs> that has a part of it, like as this ability to like mentor, um, not only um, you, not only youth, but mentoring adults to then reach out and also mentor youth. What a what an idea that is. That's a great idea, actually. I you know you always think out of the box. And whenever you and I have lunch, I always I always leave that lunch or that dinner thinking, oh, I have like 14 ideas now I need to write down. Because Gemma just gave me like great ideas. And so many of the ideas that you give me, I actually put to use. So you need to know that. You're like my mentor. You really are. You are my mentor. In so many ways, Gemma, you taught me to be a grown-up girl. And you also give me amazing ideas because you always think out of the box. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that, but you know what? That's an amazing idea because um, people are often, you know, resistant to getting involved in a young person's life. But if they were made to do it, 
they would realize that it is really easy and it doesn't take a ton of time. It certainly doesn't take money. It, it, you know, because you should be doing things for free. Most mm -hmm. of the time you should be doing everything for free and we get free tickets to things and stuff too, that help out with things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really easy and it's really fun. And, um, the, the volunteers that we get tell us all the time that they get way more out of it. They think than what they're giving, um, mm -hmm. that it's changing their life. Um, and it's making a huge impact on them as a person. We know employers, really love mentoring programs. So when they see um, mentoring on a resume, it's honestly, it's like a giant check mark. Um, it's like a stamp of approval because they know that that person has experienced a lot of, um, or, or has gained some skills that are soft skills, that those things that employers want that nobody teaches, uh, the ability to listen, the ability to, um, you know, empathize, the ability to lead, the ability to critically think about problem solving. Um, and also, you know, just just the uh, desire to think outside yourself, right? And uh, as a young person, especially, sometimes we don't see that always. It takes a while to develop that skill to realize that, you know, our time on this planet isn't just about us, it's about creating a community of people that, you know, care for one another and will um, guarantee our future existence. I think if you want to just look at it from a purely cynical standpoint, actually I do have a stat about this and, and I know I'm a little bit off topic, but well, the Boston cool. consulting group did a study on big brothers, big sisters, um, mentoring programs, year uh, 2015. And what they found out was uh, the social return on investment for youth mentoring to any community is $23 to one. So for every dollar invested in youth mentoring, I know you're going to love this because you're about numbers and you're about dollars. For every dollar invested in a, a, a youth, a big brother, big sister program or youth mentoring program, $23 is returned to the community that invests that dollar. Wow. Wow. And now that money is returned through um, through young people who more young people who graduate from high school and go to post secondary school or develop a trade, uh, higher earning, therefore uh, less burden on social systems, um, more give back. So, people uh, young people who are mentored uh, give back more to their communities through uh, you know charity and through volunteerism as well. So that, that's a good SROI. That's, um, that's, that's a pretty good measure of success. It's amazing. Imagine, imagine if we thought about how when we're supporting businesses, we ask them how they were supporting the community. And, and you know, how, setting up programs and making it easier for, for employees to give back not only of their resources, but also their time and talent. If that was like deeply honored and respected as to how it was going to make the community better, you can't help but wonder what we could do. Excellent point. Again, you know, Gemma, excellent point. Like we could, you know, um, tell, we could guarantee employers that if they gave their staff one to three hours off or even one hour a week off to go to the local school and mentor a child there for one hour a week, one hour a week, they would develop skills that they wouldn't develop in any other way. And that would be a free professional development program for them. Yeah. Free. Yes. These are good ideas. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, Becky, wow. Thank you so much for, for joining me today on Coffee Time. Thank I you. I just I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't realize about how as little as one dollar invested into social programs that help youth actually build the community by twenty three dollars. Like what an amazing statistic to really show the benefit of that little bit, like that time um, and that focus on programs. Um, you, you have to wonder when you go back and to think about that company that did that analytical work. I mean, what was removed from those communities? that led to them leading the province in poverty rates 
because it's again so incredibly interconnected as to the experiences and 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 mentoring and training that we're providing our young people as to what kind of adults that they will grow up to and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, everyone, um, thank you again for tuning in. And Becky, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Coffee Time with Gemma. It's been a great discussion chatting about big brothers, big sisters, and how mentoring changes lives and makes our community stronger. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gemma. I appreciate this so much. Thanks, Becky.